resilience, focus, discipline, courage. Some of the key ingredients in manifesting your vision into a reality. Join me as we delve into what it takes to make your mark. Hello and welcome to the Make Your Mark talk show. My name is Kim Niles and I'm going to be your host for today. In the studio today, we have a legend in the house. He's really quiet, but we're going to break that shell real soon. It is the Mr. Dwayne Morgan. Dwayne, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Awesome. So Dwayne is not just any cat on the block. Dwayne is, you know, a Canadian spoken word artist. Mm -hmm motivational speaker, 10-time author. Uh, you also founded Up From The Roots Entertainment, mm -hmm. which I want to know a little bit more about as well. But you've received many honorable awards mm -hmm. it, within the community for doing such great work, and more so though inducted into the Scarborough Walk of Fame. Mm -hmm. So Dwayne, I know you're gonna do a much better job about talking about yourself, telling us your accomplishments and what you've done, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, well, I mean, what you said is pretty much, you know, who I am, what I've done. I, I'm not a big person who likes to, you know, speak about themselves and speak about the things that I've done. I think a lot of that is is absolutely irrelevant. I think, um, you know, we've all done stuff in in different ways. You know, some some of us do things that are more out there and more people see it and it impacts more people, but everybody's kind of out there doing stuff. So I never get caught up in the accolades and all these kinds of things. I think there's always, as long as I'm breathing, there's always something else to do and I'm always trying to do something. So wherever you catch me is just, you know, a moment in time where I'm, you know, I've done a certain amount of things, but there's still a lot more to, a lot more to do. So I, I just like to create, I like to give, I like to, you know, to help elevate people. I like to challenge how people see the world and see themselves in it. And, and that's my motivation every day when I get up and, and go, go out into the world. Okay. You've done a lot more than that. So I know a lot of people always <laughs> say to me, you know, I don't want to talk about myself, but I think that there is some benefit in really sharing a little bit of yourself so people mm -hmm. can understand your journey. Based on your resume, what it says to me is you're definitely a doer. Mm -hmm. So you're not about the talking factor. You're like, what are we going to do? How are we going to activate this right now? Yep. So what led you down this path to saying, you know what, I want to create. Uh, well, I mean, it's interesting because when I started my career, I was still in high school at the time and there weren't any examples for what I wanted to do. There weren't um, many opportunities for, for young people who looked like me, who, you know, were growing up where, where I grew up uh, in Scarborough. So there was no choice but to create it, but to do it, to, to be the leader and make these things happen. So I think uh, necessity was really the thing that, that sparked a lot of what I've done and who I've become. Uh, and, you know, I've never been one to not see a door and think that, well, there's no way to get past this. I've always been, well, if you don't see the door, build a door. It's just how, yeah. it, how it is, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that has always been my mentality from the very beginning of my career, uh, believing enough in my ideas to actually do something about them. Um, because, you know, the, the whole thing around imagination and creativity and ideas is that, you know, when we're thinking, we imagine things that don't exist. And we imagine them probably because we're the ones who are supposed to create them. And so I always tell, you know, young people that I work with to, you know, pay attention to the things that you dream about, pay attention to the things that you think about, because those thoughts are being sent to you for a reason. There's a reason why that thought is in your head and not in my head. Yep. Because there's a reason, there's something you're supposed to do with it, and I don't have the capacity to do it. Yep. So every idea that comes to me, even if nobody understands it, if nobody agrees with it, I still have to figure out how do I do something with this idea because it was sent to me for a purpose. And I have to figure out, I might not even know what the purpose is. I might not even figure out what the purpose is until after I do it. Yes. But it's a matter of answering the call of what is planted in our imagination. And I think my entire career has, has been just that, just answering to whatever ideas, you know, I find in my head. Absolutely. I love that you say that because, you know, even on my drive here. So one of the things that I do every day is I listen to some sort of motivational piece or um, I'm a huge fan of T.D. Jakes, so mm -hmm. I listen to T.D. Jakes all the time. And, you know, one of the, the excerpts I was listening to this morning, 
he was speaking about the fact that, you know, God will give you an idea or give you a vision, but not give you the tools on how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder to yourself, well, why me? And then the idea is, is in order to unlock the why, you have to actually execute it to see what that breakthrough is. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that you just touched on that right. because sometimes I get some of these ideas and I'm just like, okay, well, how am I supposed to do this? Where am I supposed to start? I have no, like, it's such a great idea. I know it solves a problem, but I don't want to bother anybody anymore. I don't want to mm -hmm. ask for anything, right. right? And that's how sometimes we kind of get in our way because now you think, well, I know I can't do this by myself, I know I'm going to need you, I'm going to need you, I'm going to need you. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, here she comes again knocking at my door. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that you touched on that because I just do believe that it is true. Like the idea that you were, you have is not the same idea that I have. Right. And it, it also lends a hand to the piece on competition at times where people sometimes feel, you know, you're competing with them, but we are all given different gifts and different skill sets and also different visions. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for sharing that. Now. No I saw that spoken word piece come out just now. I could mm -hmm. see the passion start to fuel. So you were one of probably one of the first spoken word artists mm -hmm. within the GTA. How did that spark for you? How did that? How did you start that movement? Um, well, I mean, there were there were people around before me. Um, a gentleman by the name of Black Cat was very instrumental in getting things started. Um, director X, who's a big um, you know mu music video director right now, he was actually started as a spoken word artist out of um, Toronto. Uh, so there was a, a generation of young people, slightly older than than me, who kind of got things started. And uh, when they transitioned into other art forms, then I kind of took it on and kind of became the name and the face of it, and and did some things with it. Uh, so I think it was really just a matter of seeing that there was a lot of things happening in the community, understanding that there were conversations that we needed to have about them and using art as a way to address some of these ideas and, and get people in a room to actually think about things and discuss things. So um, again, it was really just a, a necessity, a, a way of bringing people together to actually discuss ideas. Okay. And have you, in, in, in launching it, did you take it over? Or did you actually launch the movement? Um, the movement had started. I just took it from a certain point and brought it to another point. So I was just a, uh, I guess I would be, like if it was, vehicle. If, yeah, if it was a relay race, I was probably the second leg of gotcha. the relay. Yeah. Okay. And what, how accepted was it at that time when you decided, because right now we hear a lot about spoken word. There's mm -hmm. spoken word everywhere. Yeah. Now, but that's also because it's, relevant and I wouldn't say relevant but it's it's become the norm now mm -hmm. right hearing the spoken word how was it start like taking it from the second leg and moving it to the next leg literally mm -hmm. at that time for you because I want to say it was 1993 yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, well um, I mean it's it's interesting because the term spoken word didn't exist at that point this okay. term spoken word came several years later in the Canadian context and what happened was that for many of us who were involved with spoken word, we were young, we were racialized people, first generation you know, in Canada, and we weren't really accepted in the poetry circles and the literary circles and that sort of thing. So we called ourselves poets, and the people who were the poets who were normally older, white, uh, didn't accept us into their world of poets, so they actually pushed us to the side and said, well, you guys, that's spoken word and we're the poets kind of thing. So that's really um, how that came about. We were, the, the term spoken word really addresses the fact that we were pushed to the side and we were excluded from this whole literary movement or whatever that was happening. So to see so many people now say that they're spoken word artists, especially people who aren't of color and that sort of thing, who might not know the history of how that term came to be and how it was used is always very interesting. Um, for me, um, but it was just, again, just one of those things where, you know, we, we were being pushed aside, but the things that we were speaking about were so relevant and so important. And it was so engaging that there ended up being a lot of friction between, you know, the, the literary community and our community, because 
you know, they would do an event and 20 people would show up and we would do an event and 300 people would show up. And suddenly everybody wanted to be at the spoken word things and everybody wanted to be a spoken word artist because it was sexy and it was cool and this sort of thing. Um, so, I mean, even today there's still a lot of tension between, you know, some poets and spoken word artists and that sort of thing. But, you know, it's, it's, it's simmered down somewhat. I like that you said that just now. So you said that, you know, it, it was a sexy term to, to be, you know, the fact that 300 people would show up and this is a, the real meaning of spoken word, it sounds like potentially could have been lost in translation mm -hmm. as it grew. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that the spoken word, the spoken word world has now just kind of been exploited in a sense? Uh, there's a lot of exploitation that's happening right now in the, in the spoken word scene with you know, everybody's a, a spoken word artist just because they wrote a poem on a napkin, and that's really not what it is. You know, I mean, it's it's much deeper than that, um, and it, it goes in in cycles and stuff. I remember when you know the Love Jones movie came out, then every guy wanted to be a poet and, and be like <laughs> the dude in Love Jones and stuff like that. So I mean, it happens. Everything is is cyclical. Um, so I mean, right now it's kind of in a phase where there's other things that I'm trying to do because. I don't really like what's kind of happening with it right now, but at the same time, there are certain events that I continue to, to produce because I know how important they are to the essence of what spoken word actually is. Okay, awesome. That's amazing. We're gonna get into that a little bit more, no but on that note, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. From a tender age, I recognized that I was not the average girl. I was always opinionated, outspoken, and for the most part, unapologetic. I was born to lead, to inflict positive change, to serve. I was born a leader. Harnessing this internal drive led me to spearheading several businesses while unlocking potential within large organizations in director roles throughout the city. While on this quest, I discovered my love for people and passion for personal development. Throughout my career, I have mentored hundreds of individuals, both personally and professionally, channeling my belief of self-care and with an avid love for fitness. Daily, I nurture my mind, body, and soul, embracing the very act of self-love. I truly do believe that you cannot give what you don't have. With a commitment to living on purpose and within my purpose, my personal mantra is to be better than I know. Hello, and we are back on the Make Your Mark talk show. And today in the studio, we have Mr. Dwayne Morgan. And Dwayne's really taking me on a journey of what spoken word is really all about. And one of the things we we're kind of talking about off camera was, you know, what is the essence of spoken word? So if you can kind of shed some light for our viewers on that, that would be amazing. I mean, the essence of spoken word is really about um, community. It's about, um, you know, sharing stories. It's about giving a voice to, you know, the voiceless uh, communities of people who otherwise have no outlet to, to express what is happening uh, with them. And I mean, if, even if you go uh, historically in the black community, um, you know, throughout Africa in different tribes, there was always a person who knew the stories of that particular tribe. And it was their job to be able to transfer that knowledge to new people that come into the community, to the next generation and that sort of thing. So that, that oral tradition of being able to, to tell stories um, has been a part of us and what we have done forever. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why we were written out of the history books because our history wasn't written down, it was told orally. Right? Awesome. So when they created the history books, they just wrote down what everybody else was writing down. Because we spoke our history, we didn't end up in the history books. Right? Now we have Black History Month and all this other stuff, but that's a whole other rabbit hole <laughs> going down right now. Right? So yeah. that's it. So what are your thoughts on Black History Month? Uh, I mean, I personally love it. I think there's uh, 
our our society and school system does a great job of miseducating black kids and kids of color. Um, and, you know, it's still somewhat misguided in that, you know, even, you know, with my daughter, there's not much she learns about herself during that month because it's kind of still, it's there, but it's up to the black teachers to kind of figure out what we're going to do. No one else knows what to do with it. No one else knows what, what, Hey, what am I supposed to do right now? Uh, so it's, it's there and it's not there at the same time. So, you know, it's a great opportunity for me to actually go into different schools, community centers, and, and actually work with people in the community about raising the awareness and, and knowledge of, um, you know, what our community has given to the world that a lot of people don't know. Thank you for sharing that because that has been in my experience. Mm -hmm. So, in schools, it is all about scrambling, and all the people that are black in the schools, which you can usually count them on one hand, mm -hmm. uh, they are left to say, okay, do you know some African dancers? Do you know a poet that you can bring in? Mm -hmm. uh, do you know a motivational speaker uh, that you could potentially come in that can, can tell the kids a story about black history? And the, pure, the intention is really not there. Mm -hmm. What it is is that it's Black History Month, and let's find some people that are black that can come in and represent for an assembly. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it is such a poor representation of our culture. Uh, and and particularly, particularly, I am not a fan of necessarily Black History Month because I believe black history should be every month. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that we should literally keep it down to the shortest month of the year to say that, you know what, we're going to talk to our kids this month about what it means to be black. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that is one of the biggest elements that is actually missing in the school system is that there is no representation and for the ones that sometimes are within those roles, they are not actually representing in those roles. They mm -hmm. are doing um, what is required at times. And that's not to say that's a label I'm putting on everybody. But once you also get into the system, you also recognize that the battle uphill is so great. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is better to say, you know what, I'm just going to work within the system. Because right. there really is no support for them mm -hmm. to enable them in order to be able to bring to the platform to show these kids who they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, identity is being lost every day, mm -hmm. right? And you touched on a great point in terms of that, you know, the fact that our ancestors told our story and our story wasn't written. So, but on that note, for you, what has been one of your greatest accomplishments? Um, I mean, my daughter is the greatest one, but career-wise, I think it would have to be... Um, I guess the, the induction into the Scarborough Walk of Fame, uh, just being able to, to look back on my career and things that I've done and realize that it actually had that level of impact um, that now I can walk and see you know, my name in the ground and I can bring my daughter and, and I caught her one day showing it off to her friends and stuff. Um, and I think that it's, it's such a, uh, a humbling experience to know that you were able to do things with your life that so many people noticed, so many people recognized, so many people thought was important, um, so that now you truly do, you know, live forever because now when I no longer exist in this physical way, people can still walk by that thing and say, who was this guy? Yes. And do the research to figure out who I was and what I did and why is my name on the ground here? And I think... You know, when you look at, you know, legacy and what you leave behind, that's part of the legacy. That's beautiful. I like that you spoke about the fact that, you know, here, like the spiritual realm for you is more so that legacy of remembering who was Dwayne Morgan, mm -hmm. you know, and earlier we were speaking about this and the fact that, you know, everyone was here before our mothers gave birth to our bodies, mm -hmm. but then when your body dies, because your body will age, it's a physicality, it's mm -hmm. going to age but then will your spirit live on? Mm -hmm. And that's for me one of the reasons why I believe that we were born to serve. We were born to, we were given the gift of being here in a physical being so that we could leave this earth better than we met it. So we could do the work. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing that your daughter can actually look back and look, look at that and say, you know, look at what my dad did. And mm -hmm. that also acts as motivation for her as well mm -hmm. so that she knows that it is possible. Someone that, you know, gave, like, looks like her can accomplish that, it's possible for me as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So, Dwayne, on the flip side, mm -hmm. what was something that made you feel like, you know what, this work in the community is not worth it? Um, 
I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing. I was having a conversation with someone before I came here, and there's, there are expectations that um, people from the community have of you when you work in the community. Mm -hmm. um, this thought that you're, you know, you're always supposed to be there or that um, I owe them something or, or you know, whatever the case may be. And, and, and we get this a lot of times where people will be like, oh, well, I've been coming to your shows for years, you know, you should do this thing for me. And it's a very interesting thing because I don't know how people come to that conclusion because the way I look at things is if I produce a show and I say, this show that I've produced is $20, and if you decide that you're looking for entertainment and are willing to pay $20 and you come to this show, I've provided a service, you've bought the service. Mm -hmm. You haven't supported me, we've exchanged. Right? Nobody goes to Disney and say, hey, I watched Lion King, Aladdin, the next one, you guys should do this for me. Nobody does that. But when you're in the community, people think, oh, it's a different situation. But no, I provided a service, you bought the service, we're even. There is no additional thing where I owe you anything mm -hmm. that doesn't exist. But because you're in the community, people see the work that you do in the community, there's this idea that, oh, this guy owes me something, and that's so far from the truth because I already gave you what I owe you. If you paid $20, I gave you the $20 worth, right? And so I think battling that mentality and trying to maintain your sanity, your integrity, because I've learned that no matter what you're going to do, the people who look like you are going to be the first to try to tear you down. You're going to be the first to have something to say. Uh, they're going to be the first to have expectations without offering anything, just expectations just because. Um, so, you know, I've, I've learned a lot over the years, and I think it has actually helped me that I'm actually an introvert because then... You I just, really? You're an introvert? I'm a I complete... Would, I, I would never complete, guess. Yeah, no, I'm a complete <laughs> introvert, so it allows me to, to withdraw from the crowds and just be in my own little bubble when I don't want to deal with, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I'm not the life of the party. People don't see me out at everything, you know, if something has to really get me out of my house to, you know, to be somewhere. And I think that has really allowed me to, to you know, maintain my sanity with a lot of the, the demands that, that people make and just a lot of the expectations that people have that aren't warranted. Well, Dwayne, we'll need to have another episode just on that topic, <laughs> to be completely honest. I can, I can contest to what you just said in terms of your people are going to be the first ones to want to tear you down. Mm -hmm. And it's really unfortunate. And I would say that for me, I've gone through the earlier part of this year, I would say has taught me that. Mm -hmm. um, it's taught me that, you know... I had to sometimes block the noise out. I had to block the noise out and I had to stay focused on what I wanted to accomplish and not pay attention to the noise mm -hmm. because it really is noise to kind of derail you from where you're, you need to go and to fulfill that dream, that mm -hmm. vision that was put upon your heart um, and also not make you bitter. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when, you know, you're doing something from your heart and you're doing it for your people and you're saying, you know what, I'm creating this space for you. And then they start to lash back. You're like, well, I understand why we all got here. Mm -hmm. And do I really want to do this? You know, if I'm creating this space and you're not, you're just trying to detail and, and try to pick me apart. And, with, and, and, and for me, I look at it as a deflection from what you're actually, the problem we're actually trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Like, why is it worth it? Why am I doing this? Right. Um, now, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm not an introvert, but I'm not fully extroverted. People would look at me and say I'm an extrovert. You probably think she's like, she's a total <laughs> extrovert, but I am not the life of the party. Um, I think I have the ability to go on and off mm -hmm. in either realm. Right. Um, but I do... I don't necessarily sometimes feel that need to have to show up in certain spaces. I show up in spaces that I feel the intention is pure. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's really important to support people that I believe that, you know, they're doing the right things for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but on that note, we are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. No problem.
Hello, and welcome back to the Make Your Mark talk show. Today on the show, we have Mr. Dwayne Morgan. So we've been having some really, really good conversation around community, around spoken word. And, you know, before the break, we were talking a little bit about some challenges that you faced in producing the work that you have. Mm -hmm. Tell us about a time when you totally, you had an idea and you totally failed. Mm -hmm. It was like a totally missed opportunity for you and how you dealt with it. Um, well, I mean, I don't think there's there's an opportunity that fits into that. I, I have failures on a regular basis, um, and I have you know ideas that just don't work on a regular basis, and um, you know it 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 stings, it hurts, you yeah. know when you when you fail when something doesn't go your way. I mean, in your head, it was the perfect thing. You don't understand why people didn't see your brilliance and why you know people didn't show up for it or, or whatever the case may be. And, you know, we live in a society today where everyone fears failure. And I believe the reason why I'm sitting here is because I'm a failure. Because it is your failure that leads you to success. It is your failure that allows you to see what you can do better. Um, it allows you to analyze why something didn't work. Um, you know, and it, it, it makes you ask yourself tough questions, right? Uh, when you never try, that learning is missed. When you succeed all the time, that learning is missed. You know, I always tell you know young people, especially because they really don't like to fail, is that you know when you when you watch sports, and you know, you see people win a championship or lose a championship, both the winners and the losers are crying. Yes, they're crying for different reasons though. One is the failure, one is the success. But you only understand and can appreciate the success because of the failure. You only understand what that means because of every time you, you sprained your ankle, every time you got benched for making a wrong decision, all of those things lead you to the success. So I've never been one to, to hide my failures. I've never been one to not try because it might not work. I understand that the more I try and the more I fail, the more potential I have to be successful. Okay. That's such a great way of putting it that, you know, potentially that we're both crying for different reasons mm -hmm. and but people only see the success. Absolutely. So have you had any mentors along the way that's helped to guide you with dealing with your failures? Uh, I mean, there's really not been anyone who's helped me deal with the failures. I think that has always just been something that I've kind of learned along the way that failure is, is part of it. Um, that, you know, nobody wins all the time. And, and I read a lot of biographies and I, I like to learn the backstory behind people that we see as, you know, successful and, and what do they really have to go through. And, and when you do that, you realize that every single person who's successful has a lot of failures in the background that led to, you know, the success. So um, for me, reading has been a big um, teacher of a lot of those things. I've had uh, mentors who've helped teach me things that I didn't know, who pointed me in the right direction, who led me to resources or contacts and that sort of thing. So I've always sought out people who um, can see my vision and um, point me in the right direction so that it's not misguided because you can have a lot of vision, but um, you're just aiming it in the wrong place, yes. you know? Uh, so a lot of people who, who, help me to see certain things because a, a lot of times we also have blind spots and, and things that we just can't see because we have this tunnel vision and we're looking here and we don't see what's over here. And when you have people who understand who you are and understand your vision, they help you see yes. over here. Right, so I like that. Thanks. So they're just kind of like your side mirrors. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to use that. That's a good one. So how do you stay resilient within yourself? Like, how do you, because obviously you faced a lot, you've dealt with a lot of uh, failures, but you've also had a ton of successes. Mm -hmm. So how do you stay resilient? Like, what are some of your coping mechanisms that you use? Um, I mean, staying resilient is really, for me, just a matter of just being present. I mean, it, it's being present in the moment, um, not, you know, Sometimes when we fail, we think we've failed at life. 
we think, oh, because this didn't work, I'm a bad person. I said, we just go down this whole negative, negative, negative thing. Mm -hmm. And when you stay in the present, you can say, oh, that didn't work. The end. Has nothing to do with you, your potential or whatever. It doesn't mean your next idea is not going to work. That didn't work. Period. Yeah. And keep it moving. Right. So, you know, I've the, the work for me has been to not allow any of my failures to become something that I take personal. Right. The, the failures are external to who I am. Right. Yeah. And I have been blessed with the opportunity to have ideas to put out into the world, not knowing which ones the world's going to accept mm -hmm. and which one the which ones the world wants or needs but just ideas. And it's my job to do something with those ideas, so I, I do. And I see which ones catch on and which ones don't, but none of them are tied to me as a person. None of them tell me my worth, my value. None of them say any of those things about me, so I'm very clear in terms of failures being external to me and not being a reflection of who I am in any way. That's amazing that you put it, you package it like that. What do you think led you to having that visual of knowing that I've attempted something, but it's not me. Mm -hmm. Because as humans, we believe that when something fails that we've tried, then we failed mm -hmm. as a human being almost. Right. So what has brought you, what would you say has attributed to you having that mindset? Um, well, I think, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, how I am able to be an introvert and spend so much of my time in front of people and speaking to people and that sort of thing. And what I had to learn is that the things that I speak about to people, the things that I say when I'm on stage, oftentimes aren't written down. I didn't practice them. I'm just speaking in the moment. And I realized that I'm simply a vessel. That's it. I'm a human being who is a vessel. And in any given moment, stuff is going to come to me and I'm just going to give it away. And when I realize that I'm here just giving away what the universe has given to me, I take myself completely out of the equation. And one of the problems for us as, as human beings is that we always want to be in the forefront of everything. We never know when to just step back and be like, that have nothing to do with me. We want everything to be about us. Yes. And it's not always about us. Yes. And I think when, you, when I learn that the positive things have nothing to do with me. I'm just giving stuff away. Then I can very easily have the negative things not have anything to do with me because it's not me, right? I am the spiritual person who's just in this body at this particular time in the history of the world. Every single day, there's a clean slate and new challenges and all those kinds of things. And I just give stuff away every day and I take nothing personal. Wow. That is a different level of consciousness, absolutely a different level of consciousness because, and I always tell people that, that, you know, for me, I, I, I say this every morning, you know, when I, I pray, I say, God, use me today as your vessel mm. to allow him to really work through me and give back to the world because I am a huge advocate for giving back and serving and naturally though. Mm -hmm. So not having a conscious effort that, you know what, I'm going to do this today. Mm -hmm. But if you could be that selfless, and just allow the energy to flow through you, mm -hmm. then you start to get also a lot of revelations, I feel, mm -hmm. that you know things make sense to you. you, you pick up on energies around you. So that's really key what you said is just to, you know, once you do realize that you're here to serve and you just allow it to come through you, because you're just, you're just a physical body, mm -hmm. but your, your spiritual being is a lot greater than what people are looking at and potentially judging essentially every day. Absolutely. Awesome. On that note, Dwayne, we are going to take a quick break and we will be right back. All right. It took a lot to get to this place to feel comfortable to wear my own hair. It took a lot of reflection and coaching and support from the team here and of course my family. Um, I know my husband really was looking forward to this experience of me exposing my hair, but I was afraid. I won't lie, I was afraid. Um, I didn't know how it would come out. I had been so used to wearing units that I couldn't imagine myself exposed with such a shortcut 
um, my jawline and everything just kind of out there. But all in all, I have to say, it was definitely a freeing experience and I'm so grateful for it. And I definitely uh, would recommend it to anyone who has that self-doubt or that unsurety about um, exposing natural hair. I definitely would take that chance. Hello and welcome back to the Make Your Mark talk show. We are having some great conversation today with Dwayne Morgan. Dwayne, so when I read your bio and I read 10 books, I was like, to where did this man's been writing his whole life? Mm. 10 books. A uh, couple of books actually specifically that stood out to me, uh, No Apologies, mm -hmm. Everyday Excellence, Revolution Starts Within, The End of the Beginning. Mm -hmm. So tell me how did your journey start as an author? Well, I mean, as I started uh, performing my work when I was much younger, um, eventually people started asking, hey, is there a book where I can get these poems? And I didn't have one. So uh, the logical thing was, if people are asking, then let me create it. So, you know, long before self-publishing existed, I started publishing my own work. And, um, you know, to date, uh, Two of the books are published by other publishers, and eight of the books I've published myself through my own business. Okay. So, No Apologies. Mm -hmm. What's that about? So, No Apologies is a collection of poems on, on race that were written during the eight years that uh, President Obama was president. Mm. So, it's, it's all looking at what was happening racially in the world during the time that the most powerful person in the world was a black man. Okay, wow. And then the other one I was very, very drawn to, Revolution Starts Within. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, again, a lot of times people always look outwardly. We, we blame other people for things, we blame society for things, but any kind of change that we really wanna see that is meaningful starts inside of us. We have to look at um, our own perspectives, our own biases, our own issues, and how those color the lens that we see the world through. So any kind of revolution first begins with the actual individual person. Okay, awesome. So, and then after your fifth book, was it just easier to write the other five? Well, I mean, I've never, with the exception of Everyday Excellence and a couple of my children's books, um, I've never really sat and said, I'm gonna write a book. I just write and then I leave stuff on my computer. And then eventually I say, okay, now it's time to put out another book. What should the theme be? And then kind of see what I've written that kind of fits into that theme that hasn't already been published. So um, it's really never been something where it's like, you know, I'm sitting there and saying, okay, now I'm gonna write a book. I don't put that kind of pressure on myself because as I said before, the, the universe is gonna tell me where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do. So, you know, we can make plans, mm -hmm. but somebody else is making a bigger plan, yeah. right? So I just try to, to, to be as open to when I'm told that now is time for another book and this is what the book should be. So I just write and let, leave it on the computer until it's time to put something out. Okay, and what, how, now you've also mentored people within the community. Mm -hmm. How have you found that working with younger people now has impacted you? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's great, the work that I do with, with younger artists, because you know, there's a lot of information that I can give to them based on what I've seen, but the younger generation does things very differently. So it helps me to stay relevant when it's a two-way uh, exchange. It's not just me giving them things, but me also being able to ask them how different things work. And, you know, because they're so much into, you know, technology and apps and all of these kinds of things where, you know, for us as, you know, the older generation, sometimes it takes us a while to get onto what's the latest thing or whatever. <laughs> and, and they've been on it two years before yes. we get there. But when you're working with younger people and they're around you and you could say, hey, what's that you're doing? And they say, oh, it does this, this, and this. Then you're just like, oh, okay. It, it, it shortens that amount of time in between when you actually can get involved with what young people are doing. And because I do so much work you know, in schools and, and in communities with young people, being able to, to have that direct access to young people is, is a great blessing. 
Awesome. And so let's shift a little bit. And on the note of young people, mm -hmm. let's talk about social media mm -hmm. for a second. So how do you feel social media has impacted our younger people today? Um, and the impact that it's also had on them. I mean, social media is a very interesting thing because it, it is a, a big mirror to the world that we live in. We, uh, social, media, uh, social media has created an environment where uh, many young people, and not even just young people, many people in general are, are now in competitions with people they've never met about who's happier, whose life is better, whose girlfriend is prettier, all of these arbitrary things that mean absolutely nothing in the grand scheme of life, but we all wanna make sure that the highlights that we post are better than other people's highlights, that our highlights are getting more likes than somebody else's highlights. And, it, and it's created a very artificial environment out, an, out of an environment that was already artificial. Yeah. So it, 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 it's, it's created all of these nuances of anxiety, depression, uh, people addicted to their technology. You know, when I go to schools and I say, you know, how many of you could concentrate if you realize that you left your phone at home? And most of the kids could not concentrate mm -hmm. for the day if they left their phone at home. Yeah. And I said, you know, if you had left your phone at home, by the end of the day, I could guarantee you would probably say that was the most peaceful day I've had in a long time. But because we don't have that separation and we won't take that separation, we'll never know it. Yes. We'll never know what that peace feels like because now we're so addicted to constantly having to be updating things, to constantly being on. It is unnatural for a human being to be as on as we now have to be, yeah. right? Where people message you and then there's a countdown to how long is reasonable for you to respond, right? And you know, for someone my age, I'm assuming maybe around your age, I remember things like a busy signal where, hey. Yeah, I'm it's busy. busy. <laughs> I'm busy. So I don't know what to tell you, but yeah. whatever you want, it's going to have to wait, yes. right? But there's no more waiting now. Everything yeah. is instant, and life does not work in an instant. Yes. But we're, we're, the technology is training people to believe that things happen in an instant. Success happens in an instant. Um, you know, everything is just instantaneous, but that is not how life works. So we're setting people up to fail, and not the good kind of failure, which is educational failure, but to just fail and sink into a hole of depression and anxiety and all of these other social ills that there's no way to get out of unless you can separate yourself from this whole world of, of technology. Amen. All right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It, it, technology trains us to be on and mm -hmm. it, there is no off button. Mm -hmm. And that is so key. And I love how you really said that because I, I haven't really thought about it in that sense, how you just say, like, you know, we're on, 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 on. There's like three devices you're connected to. You have your laptop, your iPad, your phone. And at some place, there's no way, for, there's no busy signal. Mm -hmm. Like I remember calling, beep, beep. Yeah. Like, nope, you can't get through. Mm -hmm. And it taught you patience. Yep. And that's actually the key, As in, it, it, to be honest with you, it's actually kind of how this show came about in terms of making your mark and talking about resilience. It's, talking to, it's, it's, it's aimed at talking to young people to show them that you have to go through the process and you have to trust the process. Mm -hmm. And sometimes along the way, you're going to have to pause in the process. Mm -hmm. And you won't be able to go the full yard, but... You have to trust the process and have patience. And they say patience is a virtue. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, it's a necessity because if you don't have patience, yeah. right? Well, I mean, even, even to that end, you know, with a lot of the young people that I work with, especially the ones that I mentor, you know, because I work for myself, every day, you know, looks different. And every day I have to plan out the day. And I, and I let them know that, you know, social media is incorporated into my day. Like I set when my social media time is so that I'm not there just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling because I don't have time for that. I'm gonna do social media today for an hour or whatever. I have phone calls time. No one is allowed to call me at a time when we didn't arrange a phone call. Otherwise, it just goes straight to voicemail, mm -hmm. right? And that way, I can control my time. I can be mentally, spiritually prepared for our conversation. 
Because what often happens, you might be working on something, somebody calls, you answer it, and it throws off your whole yes. day because now they just brought an energy that didn't have anything to do with what you needed for that day. Yep. So I protect my energy at all costs, right? So I know when I'm gonna be on the phone, right? I know when I'm gonna return calls, I know when I'm gonna be on Instagram. All of that stuff is built into my schedule for the day so that I can actually be productive and not just be there all the time. And people have to wait. And I have no problem making people wait because I grew up waiting. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, I'm very big on protecting my energy as well. Um, my big thing starting off the day is I have to work out. And if I don't work out at the beginning of the day, I kind of feel kind of disillusional and distorted mm -hmm. in a sense. But if I plan not to work out that day, then I know it's been pl planned into my day. But I totally understand in protecting your energy. And I also understand that certain projects, when you're working on them, you can't have any device near you mm -hmm. because it will block your ability to have a, a bigger and a wider vision mm -hmm. because there's all these distractions that are centered into your space and, uh, and they're, they're familiar distractions. Yeah. So it's not like someone walked into the room, but it's like 20 people walked into the room and they're all trying to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And But there's really nobody there aside from all these technology apps yeah. that are speaking to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just love the way that you package that in, in terms of sometimes you have to pause and take that break. Mm -hmm. And I work in schools myself and I see it and I'll say, you know, we're going to table the phones today. Everybody looks at me like, table the phones, what's wrong with her, <laughs> right? But no, we gotta put the phones down and you could see it, it, it truly is an addiction because people start moving up and down, they don't know what, oh miss, I have to make a call, oh miss, my mom has to get me, oh miss, it, you know when my mom needed to get me, she dialed the school phone. Mm -hmm. Like if it's that important, yeah. you call the front desk yeah. and then they call up to the class mm -hmm. where you should be yeah. and if, if it's an emergency, they'll get a hold of you. Yeah. Right. So and I also think, too, I've seen this is sometimes parents are enablers of this, 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 uh, this trend mm -hmm. and this new behavior because they also want access to their children. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we grow up, it was just like, no, you're supposed to be here at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if your school finishes at three. It takes you half an hour to walk. Mm -hmm. So by 3.32, 4, like, unless something went wrong, yeah. right, you should be home when I call, mm -hmm. right? And all of these little things is because, you know, it's, it's, the door is opened way too wide. Mm -hmm. And it's allowed too much freedom to come in, right. which, you know, in essence is actually that freedom. Freedom is a good thing and a bad thing. So as an entrepreneur, one of the things that I always tell people when I coach them is that, uh, you know, it sounds great to say, you know what, I get to make my entire day, I get to do what I want, I get to shape my day how I want to shape it, but that is also a big downside mm. because all of a sudden you have all this free time and if it's not managed correctly, at the end of the day, you have got nothing accomplished. Right. Mm -hmm. And then amalgamate that into a week, right? Mm -hmm. Two weeks, three weeks, a month, and all of a sudden, you have a big goal of nothing. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure you've seen this. Absolutely. Right? And you really... It's, but it's, it's crazy how people really don't look at it. So it's like freedom is a great thing, but it could also be your Achilles heel at times. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean freedom without discipline is chaos. So, yes. So, yeah, I mean, the discipline is, a, is a, a big part of it, which is why, like I said, everything for me is scheduled out so that... I don't just waste time because everybody knows that one time you went on social media to check one thing and then 45 minutes later, you're still there. You, you check the thing in the first minute, the next 44 minutes, you're just checking one set of foolishness and you're just there wasting time. And it's like, what could you have done yes. with that 44 minutes? Yeah. What else could you have done? And, you know, when I, so when I go in and I, I work with young people in schools, it's getting them to see that it's like, yeah, if you have a dream of what you want to do, but you're scrolling on Instagram, don't be upset if you see another young person living the life you want to live. Yes. Because they made another choice for their time. And you're going to end up scrolling on Instagram, watching them live the life that you wanted to live. But you're living the life that you chose. Yes. Because for you, scrolling on Instagram was more important 
than doing the work to become who you want it to become. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't, don't like to see it that way because they oh, it's just entertainment. I say, there's no such thing as just entertainment. That is a choice that you are making for what is actually a priority in your life. And if you have to choose between social media and doing the things that you need to do to become who you want to become and you choose social media, it means you don't really want to become this. Yes. And a lot of people don't want to hear that reality, but that is the truth. Because how serious you are will always come down to your actions. I can watch your actions for a day and tell you how serious you are about whatever it is that's coming out of your mouth. Yes. Because it will always be reflected in your actions. Absolutely. So, yeah. Perfect. So Dwayne, as we begin to wrap it up, what is your definition of success? You know, I, I, I've always had a very interesting relationship with success, and I actually speak about it in my Everyday Excellence book because I think, you know, success is a very individualistic thing. I don't think that there is a definition of success that everybody can wear because you had alluded to it before. Um, you know, we, we do all these comparisons and, and things, but it's like, it's, it's almost like running a, a race, a bunch of racers on a track. And if you're running the 100 meters and I'm running the 400 meters, we're both still on the track, but we're starting at different places, yeah. but we're also ending at different places. And we're not in a competition if we're not starting and ending at the exact same place. But it's very rare that you're gonna find two people who are gonna start and are trying to get to the exact same place. So there really is no competition with anybody. So success has to be a very individual thing. So for me, um, being su successful is just waking up and being happy with where I am in life and being able to accept where I am in life. And that doesn't mean that everything is great and there's no bad days and any of these things. It's just being able to accept it as this is what it is. And then do the work yeah. to move from there, to stay there, whatever the case may be, but it's just that piece of being okay with where you're at. Yeah, awesome. That's a really good way to put it as well. because. It's such a different lens. Mm -hmm. Every, we all wear a different lens. Absolutely. So, Dwayne, what would you say would be three things that you've learned that you would pass on to young people that from your experience, how to stay holistically resilient? Um, well, the first thing is to fall in love with yourself. Um, don't worry about the cute guy or the cute girl. They don't matter if you don't love yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? So first things first, you got to fall in love with yourself. And again, that doesn't mean there aren't things about yourself that you don't like, that you want to improve, whatever. Just that level of acceptance so that when you look at yourself, you don't see all the things that need to change, but you see all the things that you love. Yes. And then you look at yourself every day and you tell yourself how wonderful you are. So that's the first thing. Okay. Um, the next thing, I think, you know, the, the greatest lie told to human beings is that we have time. Everybody believes we have time. Mm -hmm. I have no guarantee that after this interview, I'm gonna see my daughter again. I assume life is gonna go on and I'm gonna see her and everything's gonna be great because we all assume we have time. When you understand that the only guarantee you have in life is right now, it changes what you decide to do because you understand that who I want to be is going to be a reflection of what I choose right now in this moment. So acknowledging how important right now is, acknowledging that right now is the only thing that exists, is the next piece to it. And then the, the third and final piece is, kind of going back to the beginning of the conversation, is, is fail often and fail big. And fail as much as you can and try to learn from every one of those failures so that you never make the same mistake twice. But you're always making, you're, you're leveling up on your failures because that means you're gonna level up on your success. Amazing, such great advice. I love that, you know, the time piece. Mm. Uh, you know, people always take time for granted and Absolutely. say, you know, I got time, let me just think about it, let me just, and time waits for no man. Mm -hmm. So, Dwayne, this has been an amazing conversation. I truly appreciate you. I appreciate all the work that you've done within our community and continue to do. And I, I look forward to, to what 
else you're going to give birth to because I don't believe that you're done. You came down here with a whatever millimeter camera (laughs) and I believe that you will continue to create and inspire us through art. Mm -hmm. And so thank you so very much for being on the show today. How can our viewers reach you? All right, uh, my website is DwayneMorgan.ca or on social media, it's Dwayne underscore Morgan. Okay, awesome, right. good stuff. Thank you all for joining us today. This has been a very, very informative show. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at MakeYourMark.ca. You've logged on to the site, hopefully, and you're following us at MakeYourMark.ca. Till next time.